Well, thank everybody coming out on a uh, blustery night, which uh, nearly blew me away, and, but I made it. Um, exactly as Davide said, I'm going to talk particularly around high-performance computing and uh, how accelerators and, and GPUs, and I'll explain what each of those might mean uh, as we go through in case anybody doesn't quite understand what they are. Um, how, how they are actually going to be developing over the number of years coming uh, going forward and what's actually going to be happening in the future. So that's really what I get, where I'm going to aim it. If I say any names, anything that you don't understand, please shout out as we go through. It doesn't have to be uh, um, just me talking and then, then you not. So if there's any part or anything you want me to expand on, by all means, let's just uh, go through it. The more It's better that you actually perhaps you know understand what I'm saying as opposed to um, just keeping quiet. So NVIDIA have been around since uh, 1993, so over two decades now. And they originally coined the term GPU, Graphical Processing Unit, um, almost as a play on words of CPU, Central Processing Unit. Uh, that has now been used by many other companies as well as uh, NVIDIA. And that's still what we do today, is really to do with uh, producing graphical processing units. However, that's extended way beyond the term of GPU, and as I'll explain going forward, uh, it means we actually fit into a number of other areas. We have four different product lines. I'm not going to really talk too much about product lines or products, but at least so that it, it puts in perspective in your mind. We actually started off in 93 as a, produ a producer of gaming cards. So many of you will either have seen or know about NVIDIA through gaming cards. Uh, GeForce is the name of that product line. So things like GTX 980, 740, and there's a number of uh, cards around that many people will be aware of. And so usually whenever I say, if I say to anybody that I work for NVIDIA, they usually say, ah, the gaming card company. Um, and that is true. And that is still true today, that the, the majority of our revenue, money, comes from gaming. So it's still a big part of what we do. Now, the second bullet going along there is Quadro. What we then did is actually took the technology we're using for accelerating graphics for gaming, which is what these GPUs do, graphical processing units, uh, and then used them in industry. So enterprise versions of those, and that's what Quadro is. So again, it's something that accelerates the graphics going up to the screen. What, what the difference being there is, or, or the difference between a Quadro and a GeForce, is really to do with uh, the actual manufacture of the Quadro product is something that NVIDIA have total control over. GeForce, the design, is made by a number of different companies. So they're not actually made by NVIDIA as such. And so what you buy as a, as a GTX card to go in your gaming system, it is uh, um, a GeForce card. It's, it should actually uh, com uh, be as the design said, but it wouldn't necessarily be made by NVIDIA. Quadro, on the other hand, definitely is. And so that is what uh, we are going to sell to enterprise com uh, customers, to commercial customers, because we can actually say, we can guarantee that card. We know it's going to work for you. What that one does is it is doing, as I said, graphics, GPU, graphical processing unit. When we move to the next one, Tesla, it's the same technology. The board looks pretty damn similar. It still does parallel processing, which is what the graphics cards do by accelerating all of these parallel lines of uh, pixels going up to the screen. But with, when you get to Tesla, what we're doing then is actually just um, using that parallel pipeline to accelerate um, numerically intensive computing. So adding numbers together, as opposed to just accelerating something that goes to the screen, a parallel workload of actually computation as opposed to graphics. As it happens, they can do graphics, but that's not what they're intended for. And generally, Tesla cards, so that product there for HPC is you will see into uh, you will see in servers as opposed to workstations or PCs, which the first ones will will be in. So generally, as you go forward, that will, you will see in PC or workstation. The Quadro is a card just to do graphics that you will see to do in CAD design, 
if for BMW, for Airbus, for all of these companies. Tesla will do the high performance computing. So for those same companies, maybe BMW, this is where they will do their fluid dynamics on a card like this. But to do matrix multiplication as opposed to the graphics to the screen. The last one, which is very different and is not a GPU, is Tegra, which I'm not going to talk about too much. Tegra is what we call SOC, a system on a chip. There is a standalone processor uh, based on ARM uh, processors, CPUs that are actually in there, but it's for the mobile space. So it's for mobile phones, it's for tablets, but we also use it in uh, cars for the infotainment, also for things like self-driving cars, and it's also used in robotics now. And so again, we work with uh, Plymouth University to, to put them into robots as well. What I'm going to be talking about is the world of enterprise, so HPC for commercial companies, and in particular, the one in the middle, as I said, is Tesla. Just briefly, I'll mention the one on the left-hand side, which is Grid, which almost falls in between the other two. So what Grid does is to actually do graphics output, but from a server. And so this is so that you can actually centralize all your graphics in one place, in a computer server room, a data center, and have the graphics sent out just as pixels through to each of your workstations, rather than every workstation having a GPU. Not that one, that one. That'll be better. So that's what a GPU looks like. I didn't bring one with me, but they're around about the size of a book, if you've not seen one, about this sort of size, about the similar thickness that you would normally put into your workstation or into a server. So that's how, how they fit. Um, they can be uh, a smaller uh, size, as you can see that uh, the one down in the front here, which can fit into laptops. So there are a number of different uh, formats for it, but the mass, vast majority are these bigger uh, units. thing I always find amazing is they've got 7 billion transistors on them. So that is just one GPU now. And considering there are 7 billion people in the, on the planet at the moment, so I believe, there's one for every person on the planet in every one of the GPUs, which is quite astounding, I think. So how a GPU works, they're not an individual processor, um, not like the Tegra, the SOC that I was mentioning just now. They are a coprocessor. They only accelerate part of your code. So if you're writing an application and you're running your application, it will not run just on the GPU. You have to have a CPU to start it off with. So it's a coprocessor. And that's how they grew up, because they were only doing the graphics acceleration to begin with, and that's how it's gone on. So for high-performance computing, it's exactly the same thing. So you still need a CPU and a GPU to do the work. The way that you share the work out is the way that the application is written. But the way that it is done is that the CPU is very good for sequential tasks general tasks, um, things like Word and Excel, and, and many sequential tasks that your program would write works really well on a CPU. If you have any parallel tasks, anything that you can actually divide up into a parallel workload, that's exactly where GPUs come in. That's where they really excel, and they really accelerate that. So just in terms of cores, you see that with uh, supposedly has six cores for a uh, CPU. Nowadays we're talking more like 10, 12, 16 or more cores. Um, the cores on a, a GPU tend to be in the thousands, usually over 3,000 cores that you actually have on there. So the way that you can actually divide up your workload, if you have something that you can divide up into a number of parallel streams, the GPU should work very, very fast and should accelerate that. And luckily, that's what we find. So depending upon whatever your workload is for doing high performance computing, numerically intensive computing, whatever term you want to put, the GPU is a very good platform for doing this if your code is parallel. And luckily, most codes tend to do, most scientific codes most tend to, to be reliant on matrix multiplication, from multiplying two sets of numbers together, and this works very well. To be absolutely fair, those numbers up there are a bit on the high side, I would say. It's a bit of a marketing slide. They're absolutely true. There's a benchmark behind every one of those. 
but if I see a code that is going 100 times faster on the GPU than the version that would have been written on the CPU, which is what this is, 100 times faster than the, the normal CPU version, then I usually think that code has been written badly to begin with because it's normally the rewriting of the code, restructuring of the code that's made a lot of that performance. Generally, for a GPU, I would be expecting the five or ten times speed up, which is still not bad, no slouch. You know, if you can actually put just a GPU in there and suddenly your code is running five or ten times faster, that makes a big difference to many enterprises. If you're talking you know, BMW, I mentioned, you know, if they can actually design their cars faster, 5x faster, well, they're interested. So it does make a, a compelling case. What I've actually shown up there is the, the blue line is for uh, a CPU, uh, and the two green lines are two different versions of a GPU. Uh, both of them are available at the moment, and the one with the longest and darkest green line is the, the current standard double precision GPU that you'll buy called a K40. Which I'll lead you into a little bit on the technology itself. Two main numbers on here, and I'm not going to test you on it after, but if you're interested you can, can look. Um, it's basically showing what products you can actually buy at the moment of the Tesla range for high performance computing. And this is the name of them here where it says GPU K10 up to K40. The K10 is particularly targeted at single precision workloads. Works very good for um, oil exploration, oil and gas, uh, energy. Uh, it also is very good for some of the um, uh, security services tend to actually use uh, single precision workloads where they're doing comparisons. But for the majority of high performance computing, which we tend to see in science, tends to be the top three, so the K20, K20X, and K40. But you can see the sort of sizes we're talking about in terms of flops. Um, so a K40 is running at around about 1.4 teraflops. Um, I'm assuming people know flops, uh, floating point operations per second. So the, the amount of time or the number of floating point operations, adding two numbers together, it can do every second. Uh, so we're talking there you know, around about 1.4. Good question. Um, the only reason is more from a software point of view and what we actually put in that package. So the difference between a Quadro for a workstation and the Tesla for, uh, for a server, if you looked at it, there is not a huge deal of difference. One of them supports some of the graphics a little bit better than the, the Tesla version, but they're both coming closer and closer together. So the newest one, the K40, is very good at doing some of the graphics for OpenGL, for instance. And so they are mm, close. Um, the other big difference, though, is the actual cooling. So the workstation variants tend to have a fan on them. And the picture I showed up, up earlier, the one where I said it's a, 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 a looked like a book, it had a fan on there, I don't know if you noticed. Uh, and that means that it's not reliant on the... Uh, the enclosure for cooling itself. It can cool itself. The server variants tend to not have that. They, they tend, it depends on which one they have, whether it be to, to do with um, uh, a transfer unit or whatever, but they are reliant on the server to either blow cold air across it and have a fan to actually do that or some other form of water cooling or something like that. You saw that all of those products that we have today began with a K. That K stands for Kepler. And we basically have a different design coming out, usually about every two years, a different design of the architecture. Uh, we started with the very first one called, called Tesla, to make it confusing. This is the whole Tesla range. We call this Tesla. The very first one was called Tesla. Um, but then we, you can see we've named them after uh, famous scientists from then on. So Fermi was the last one, and the current one's Kepler. And you see K40, K80, you'll see in a moment, K, K10. And then going forward, Pascal and Volta. Um, 
what we have learned, one of the things we have learned, is to actually use a name of a scientist who is long dead. Um, when we used the Tesla name, um, we soon had a, a, an email from the Tesla Foundation who wanted a bit of money from us for using the Tesla name. And so we've learned that lesson now, and so it's very long dead scientists you will find on any of the names of the products going forward. So they're not going to come and ask for any money. So you'll see that the next one in the range after Kepler, which is the current one, is Pascal. You may also see that there's a little bit of a gap in between Kepler and Pascal. If I was talking to you about purely graphics, so if you remember we're talking Quadro and G-Force for the graphics acceleration, there's another one in there called Maxwell, another long dead one. Uh, and the Maxwell processor is particularly good for graphics acceleration but it doesn't necessarily transfer over to high performance computing. So high performance computing, we're saying that the next one, the next proper product will be the Pascal product. But as you said, some people might well buy a Maxwell product, a Quadro version of Maxwell to actually try, try that and see how fast it will go. But we've decided that the acceleration you get for high performance workloads is not enough for us to actually bring out a special product for HPC. So, what do we have? Today, there is the K40 is the top of our range. Uh, so the K40 is our fastest processor um, uh, that we have, and certainly for double precision workloads, that is what, if you, were, if you wanted to buy a, process, a GPU for scientific work, then I would say buy a K40. You don't have to worry about anything else. If it was single precision, I would still say the K10 might be better. You don't worry, I have to look back for that because I'm going to take that off the table in a moment by uh, giving you something else to, to think about. So the K40 is a lot faster, a lot better than the products we've had in the past, of course, everyone is. Um, there's more memory and it runs faster and it's got GPU boost. The K80 is, um, is not been announced yet, so this is confidential for another week. But at supercomputing next week, we will announce the K80. Uh, the K80 is going to actually replace the K40 and also the K10s. Doesn't matter if you've forgotten what those two mean, because I'll tell you again in a moment. What the K80 is, is it actually is two GPUs all on the same card, so you end up with two. The reason why we do this is that it's really to do with the energy levels. If you see here, it says about power 300 watts. Now, our good friends Intel, sometimes called competitors Intel, um, have come out with a, a very similar product to a, a, a GPU uh, called Phi, Xeon Phi, uh, which looks exactly the same, same box size, except theirs is blue and ours is green, and they came out about three or four years after us, but apart from that, absolutely the same. Um, no, it isn't. It, it's a, it is a slightly different product, but um, because Intel are a bigger company and they sell CPUs into all of the vendors that produce servers, you know, the Dells, the HPs, the IBMs, whoever, um, they managed to convince those people that 300 watts, the amount of power to drive one of these things, was acceptable. And so suddenly, we were given the same option you could supply a product which were 300 watts. Now up until then, all of our products were around about 225 or 235 watts. So this is the electrical power to drive these things. And you'll see right at the end of my, my talk why this perhaps makes some difference, power I'm talking about. Um, but because Intel had said to, uh, to vendors you could do this, um, or asked vendors, told, that, uh, that 300 watts was what was required. We had it back to us. What could you supply to us then that was 300 watts? The obvious thing would be to, okay, we could make our chip a bit bigger, have a few more cores on there, and it will run a bit faster. But with GPUs or any coprocessor, it's usually the memory bandwidth or the amount of memory that your processor has got, which tends to be the defining factor. And particularly for high performance computing, if you've got more memory and faster memory bandwidth, you will tend to work better for the scientific workloads, high performance computing. So the idea was, is that rather than going for one bigger one, we would actually go for two smaller ones, 
because it gives us more circumference around the edge and because anybody knows much about the uh, about how CPUs and processor are, are actually designed the memory is actually around the edge of a processor and so as soon as we make it bigger that gives us a, a circumference yay big if however we double it we get much more circumference more area where you can attach the memory and so we decided to actually go down that route so that's why we've gone for two GPUs all on the same card so for high performance computing we're expecting and do see um, much better uh, performance than that than having one big mega processor Absolutely, it is. Um, and you'll see later on we talk about sort of uh, less power. But you're, you're right. The whole point of uh, now we're going to uh, many core, multi core, whichever way you want to go, all of the cores tend to be. So if you look on the CPU world, the clock speed that any of these processes are running at are getting lower and lower. And which is, tends to be the, the big problem, or one of the big problems, I guess, in computing in that if you have a sequential application that could only run on one core say which luckily most are now being changed to be multi-core um, but if it can your program will run slower and slower as each of the cores themselves the individual cores get slower because the clock speed is taken down so they can use less memory so that is ab absolutely the case what we look at though is actual performance per watt how much performance power can you get out relative to the amount of electrical power that you put in and I'll show you how that works probably in about 10 minutes time uh, about how that will, will fit in but you're absolutely right that is the key question um, about whether we can actually reduce the amount of power but still get the same or better computer performance out uh, as we go forward so you're you're right but um, we're talking there 2.7 teraflops on boost for 300 watts versus 1.6 for 235 watts so the actual performance per watt is very good going forward but you're right it, it looks as though it's more um, just a quickie um, on the, the bubble charts uh, this one is showing our older products that you saw and the newest product the actual bubble size is memory size how much memory can you fit around there and as I discussed because we've got two we can get more memory around it that's what we'd expect um, peak double precision so the double precision flops and memory bandwidth going that way but what is quite good for us anyway and I think for the consumer as well is that if we're talking single precision flops which is over on the left hand side even for single precision this is very good what it basically means, you know, bottom line, is that K80, the new product, will replace all of our current products. So if, you, if you've got single precision workload, if you're working in oil and gas, if, you're, uh, if you've got double precision workload, if you're doing genomics or whatever you might be doing, K80. The answer is always going to be K80 if you've got the power. So if you have 300 watts that you can get through your server, go for it. Um, you would performance per watt will be the best however we're still going to keep the K40 going forward if anybody can only limit it to 230 watts okay so that's where we were this is where we're going Pascal if you remember is the architecture the next one uh, that will begin with a P for all these processors when they come out or maybe it may be just one to replace them uh, and this is at the beginning of 2016 so we're talking 18 months away potentially it's a smaller processor in that we can fit probably three maybe even four on a GPU so we're talking two today now we're talking three maybe more we'll see on how that goes <coughs> but the interesting um, technologies that are actually going to be useful to anybody doing HPC is NVLink which I'm going to talk about in a moment so don't worry that you don't know and understand it and 3D memory often called stacked memory or high bandwidth memory HBM so those are the two that are going to be really really useful to you 
when I say there's two, there's three, obviously. <laughs> there's a, th a third one as well, which is to do with unified memory. And uh, this is something that can be done uh, in, in software with our current CUDA language, um, which allows us to seem as though we have a unified memory space between the CPU and the GPU. So for uh, you know, a very quick 101 on GPU programming, if, you, if you're going to run a job which has some parallel parts, you need to set, send that part of the job, a uh, subroutine, say, kernel is the term we use, over to the GPU to, to, to run that job. Fine. However, you also need to pass across any data that's needed. Those matrices you're going to multiply together have to be passed across from CPU to GPU. What virtual memory does is it makes it look as though that's already there and that you don't have to do that passing mechanism. And so your application, when you write it, you don't have to do, uh, for anybody who knows CUDA, things like mem copies, so copying from one piece of memory to another. All of that is taken away. In the Pascal time frame, much of this is done in hardware for you. And so it, it really does take it away from a programming point of view, you don't need to worry about where your data is. And that's the whole idea of it. The other two, as I said, um, stacked memory or 3D memory. I was saying earlier that memory is placed around the CPU. So you put it around the perimeter of a CPU, but it tends to, well, it is today, often thought of as 2D memory. There's just stacks of memory, memory dims usually, probably most people know that of dims of memory that are around your CPU in the middle. Well, stack memory is, is actually 3D memory, and you have a number of different area levels of memory, all exactly the same, but you can actually connect them directly through silicon in between, down through what's called an interposer in between, and that data then goes through and then up into the CPU, which is in the middle. I hope you sort of followed that. Um, so basically, you have stacks of memory around the GPU, which means you can have more memory close and attached, but actually the speed, the way it's connected, is much, much faster. And so we're talking, uh, what's it saying, many, many times the bandwidth. I think we're talking four times the bandwidth and two and a half times the capacity of, of memory. I think that's probably an underestimate about how much memory we can put there. The downside of it is that uh, memory is expensive, it's expensive today of course, stack memory is going to be really expensive. Uh, it's not anything that we control uh, either. This is, um, this is not our technology, stack memory, it's not NVIDIA's technology. You'll see the same thing coming through Intel for their CPUs and for their Phi processors, but it will make a difference to us, particularly to do with memory access. Now a quick talk about what I called NVLink. NVLink is not it may be called something different um, by the time you really hear about this. So again, it's uh, confidential at the moment. Um, but it's to do with how you connect the CPU and the GPU to pass this data about particularly. As I said, you would start running your job, your application on a CPU. You'll then pass over the information to the GPU to do its work. But you also need to pass the data. At the moment, that goes through PCI. So a connection through the top. The size of these arrows is supposed to be representative of the numbers that are up there. So you can see that PCI at the top, the connection between the only connection between the CPU and GPU is at 16 gigabytes a second. So that's how data can pass between these two things. The actual connection between the CPU and its memory, so where the data is held, is around about 60 gigabytes a second but for a CPU, that's what you get. And we tend, always tend to go for the best because we've got all these parallel processing applications running uh, in our uh, system. The GPU has got 288. However, if you have to pass all this data across that soggy bit of string at the top, it's 16 gigabytes a second, it is a little bit of a bottleneck for us for actually passing data and it can slow the application down. So what we're introducing is a new way of doing this called MVLink. Uh, as I said, the name may change by the time you hear about it, but today most people were calling it MVLink, or certainly inside it, uh, NVIDIA. 
what this means is that there's a direct connection, a much better connection, a much faster connection um, between the CPU and the GPU. And I think on the next few slides I'll show on how that looks and what speed you're going to get. It can work in a couple of ways. Um, this way is showing it between a CPU and multiple GPUs. So if you had one CPU and a lot of GPUs connected together, which you may be interested in doing, you can connect all of those GPUs with NVLink and basically all of their memory space is available to you at a very fast speed. That's, that's one thing you can do. What it doesn't show on this uh, diagram here is it's still got that soggy bit of string, PCI, connecting the CPU into the GPUs. The more favorable way is if you actually put that link directly between the CPU and GPU. Now here, we're expecting for the first version, which comes out in 2016 with, this, with Pascal, the new chip, it's going to run it around about 80 gigabytes a second to actually transfer data. Now if you remember, we were saying around about 60 gigabytes a second between memory and CPU. We don't have any problem here. We're actually going to go up to a terabyte a second over here, so don't worry about how that's going to go, the speed. What it means is that your GPU now can access the memory, the data, if you like, from the CPU's memory without any restriction. You're going across a, a bandwidth of 60, of, of eight, sorry, 80 gigabytes there. So the, the actual restriction is down here now. It's 60 gigabyte, gigabytes a second. So we're taking that away completely. The actual speed you can get your data over to do your parallel processing is much, much faster. And so we're hoping that that's going to um, give us very, very big performance increases. Damn good question, and I'm just coming to that. <laughs> I'll give you a tenor after for these questions, <laughs> just to set me up. That all works very, very well. However, the CPU vendor, in this case, Intel produces most of the CPUs we, we use today, has to be compliant. They have to agree to, to implement their side of NVLink, this connection. Intel are unlikely to do that, let's say. Intel are a competitor of NVIDIA. Um, they've often said that, um, well, they first said that GPUs are, are not the way forward. Now they've decided that perhaps they might be, and that's why they've come out with Phi, their own coprocessor. They're not going to work with us. And so something for an Intel processor, where we actually ask them to implement a side of a protocol which is an NVIDIA protocol is not going to happen. So if you remember a couple of slides back you saw that um, oh no 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 that way that was the one there's a good use of using NVLink if you have multiple GPUs the CPU just sends over some stuff via um, uh, NV, uh, via PCI. That is what the model will look like on an Intel processor going forward. It doesn't give us everything. Absolutely not, unfortunately. I'd love to say yes, and we'd love to work with Intel uh, to say, can you implement your side of the, of the NVLink uh, partnership? It's not going to happen. Very unlikely, let's say. But we're, we would talk to anybody or any vendor that could actually do this. So we're talking to not only, and you'll see in a moment, processor vendors, and there are others other than Intel, luckily, um, but also NIC network connection vendors, so people like Mellanox, so that we can actually send NVLink through the, inter through the uh, interconnects uh, out into, uh, from server to server. So what we're saying here is that Intel are not the only um, CPU vendor around. We also have, let's say, start with power. So IBM, as probably many people have read, 
is IBM uh, have now transferred all of their Intel business to Lenovo. Uh, they did it about I don't know, a couple of years ago with their workstation business and just this month is completing for the, uh, the server business, which basically means that IBM themselves make no servers based on x86. However, they do have their own line called Power, which people may or may not have heard about. They're used in many, particularly big systems, mission critical systems, banking systems, SAP system, payroll systems. So they're used many places around the world. However, with Power 8 and going forward, they're hoping to extend this because, as I said, they've passed on uh, the Intel business to Lenovo. They're now hoping to set, have their own uh, CPU business, but based on power. So they're getting in the market now to compete with Intel. IBM do want to implement NVIDIA NVLink more than they do, they have already. Um, so they've already started doing this. We're not going to get the full speed until next year with Pascal, but they are actually doing this work. IBM's point of view is, yes, this is going to be great for uh, HPC, for high-performance computing, but they're also doing it for their general, what they call enterprise workloads, for, SA, for SAS, for SAP, just you know, payroll stuff. They have these big systems, and they're now going to be relying on GPUs to accelerate the, that for them, which is great news for us, of course. It, great news that you're now going to have accelerated Java, accelerated Hadoop, so all of these things are now coming out that will all work very fast on a GPU. It helps us in the HPC world because it just means that there's a bigger market for people buying these systems. There's more chance that they're going to invest more money. The one that's probably the most interesting is the one in the middle there, which is ARM. Now many people, uh, many people say that ARM is going to be the future. Uh, partly because they see them being used in uh, their mobile phones or their tablets and they're very low power. And I've hinted at this a couple of times and I'll go into it more in a moment, but power is going to be our real problem going for electrical power going forward. ARM are very low power uh, CPUs um, and that's why we do use them in, in phones. They're very, very good for that. However, we will be using them for as CPUs in servers moving forward and already there are a few vendors out there that are actually supplying these and luckily they're all buying into NVLink. So the message is that by the time we get to 2016 when we actually have the Pascal processor out, the one that actually supports NVLink properly from a GPU point of view, all of the ARM servers and all of the power servers will also support this. x86 unfortunately not but the other ones will, and we will actually see then what the big difference will be between something that has PCI just connecting the, CP, the, the CPU and GPU and NVLink. If your application is very parallel, and there are many out there at the moment, there may not be any very much difference at all because they tend to sort of pass the information over right at the beginning of the, the program, and it all runs on the GPUs, and you just put extra GPUs, and that will all work fine on an x86 system. Anything that is a bit of sequential work, now a bit of parallel, a bit of sequential, a bit of parallel, that will run much faster on something that has NVLink between the two. So the last section, um, where I see the future of HPC going, where is it going to be in the next few years? Now luckily, more and more people are buying into um, accelerators. I use accelerators as a generic term, whether it be GPUs from NVIDIA, whether it be Intel FIs from, uh, from Intel, obviously, or, uh, or AMD processors uh, or accelerators. Generally, the market is accepting. It tends to be the only way to get certainly the bigger systems for high performance computing, and particularly going up to Exascale, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, you need to actually have some form of coprocessor, an accelerator to actually do this. CPUs are not going to be man enough to do the job. Luckily, as we stand at the moment, NVIDIA has the biggest market share. I'm sure that will change. Uh, Intel are a big company. 
you know, they're coming out. There's a new version of Intel Phi coming out. Could be next year, could be the year after, but uh, called Knight's Landing, which I'm sure many people will be buying. However, it will mean that the market grows even bigger. And so even if we only end up with 50% share of the market, if the market's got bigger, hey, we're happy. So there's something called the top 500, which I'm guessing a number of you will have already heard of, which is a list of the top 500 supercomputers. Every six months, they, they, they produce a list. Um, so this, this group. And this is a list going from 1993 up to the present day, up to the last one of 2014. So flops, I'm assuming you're all okay with flops. Floating point operations per second, adding two of these things, how many you can do per second. I uh, see a petaflop when we hit the petaflop uh, up there. So a petaflop is one quadrillion flops, which is a 10 with 15 zeros after it. If you can imagine that number, that's how many operations of adding two numbers together every second, which is rather a lot. What this is showing is the dark green line in the middle is the number one of the top 500. So that's the fastest machine at each one of the years. The is that gray line, the, whatever the bottom line is, is the, the number 500 on that list, the slowest one of that list. And the yellow or very light green line is actually a summation of all of the top 500 flops that you have. I, I find this one amazing as well, that it's... It looks linear. Of course, as you will have noticed, it's a log scale up on the left-hand side. So there's exponential scaling. But when you actually put it on a log scale, you could predict what the fastest machine is going to be next year, in 10 years' time, or it seems to. You, you can actually just plot it. And even though that technology has not been invented yet, well, just looking at the past, we think we could actually say what it's going to be. So what does that really mean? What does that mean to today? Well, at the moment, I guess probably quite a few of you have got an iPhone. So to put this into perspective, if you had an iPhone 5, which runs it around about 1.2 gigaflops, that would actually get on the list of the top 500 in the world supercomputers in around about 1994, maybe 1995, somewhere between there. So you're, you're phone in your pocket would have been one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. A laptop, sort of a quad-core laptop, pretty, pretty standard these days, that would have got on the list in 2001 as being a fastest supercomputer in the world. It would have been faster than the first supercomputer on that list. Maybe even, I won't quite get up onto the second year, but on the first list, it would have been the fastest supercomputer. Just a, a crummy old laptop that I run PowerPoint on would have been the fastest supercomputer you've got. And you've already seen the numbers we're getting for GPU. So just one GPU in a bottle, you know, this size now, where we're getting to, it would have got on the list. 2006 sort of time frame, it would have been number one on the list in around about 1998 time frame, which was ASCII red, if anybody's old enough to remember those sort of, which was a, a room certainly this size, if not bigger, of computers. And we're talking, you yeah, know, this GPU here. Um, and it would have been faster than all of the top 500 when it actually first started out. It's not sort of bragging for NVIDIA, it's just actually just showing the actual speed with which things are moving forward. The actual performance speed moving forward is one thing. All right, I'll show you these two first, then I'll go on to the electrical power, which was what I was just going to say. I forgot I had these in there. So uh, up near the top, this was the top up until six months ago, which is a, a machine called Titan in Oak Ridge, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories in America. It's got 18,000 GPUs and... Um, Strangely enough, it comes out around about 18 petaflops of Limpac. So you can see that most of that is probably coming from the GPUs, which you'd be absolutely right for the actual performance. Uh, number one at the moment is a machine called Tiani 2, which is in China. Um, 
why I can call that one the fastest open science is because no one quite knows exactly what's happening on the China machine. They know there's some defense stuff going on, maybe some nuclear stuff going on. But I've also heard that they've only managed to turn it on once full power to do the Limpac run to get on the top 500 because it uses so much electrical power there isn't enough power stations around to run it. I think all the lights dim when they actually turn it on. In, in Europe, the fastest supercomputer in Europe is called PISDAN, which is down at CSCS, down in Switzerland. Uh, a lot of its work is to do with uh, weather forecasting, use Cosmo on there, but also on uh, climate change and climate prediction. So it's a very good, uh, uh, good things it's working on. Both of those two computers I, I showed you, the uh, Titan system in the US and this system here in Europe, are both accessible and available to all of you. Anybody can actually apply to have some time on there. So if you had a program, a little parallel program that runs on your, even your you know, workstation, one GPU, potentially, if you manage to blag it, you can say, I would like to run it with 10,000 GPUs on Titan. And if they say yes, you get it. I know many people they say yes to, and some people I was with in Imperial last week, Imperial College, they're using it. People down in Southampton are using it. So it is there and available to, to academia, let's say, research. I hinted at uh, power a number of times already, electrical power. Uh, and as well as the top 500, there's also the green 500. And they take those top 500 supercomputers and then order them in power efficiency, electrical power efficiency, and in performance per watt. This one's slightly out of date, and I'm showing the uh, top system. So an exaflop is 10 with 18 zeros after it, floating point operations per second. So yeah, you try and work it out, I can't. Um, but there are many reasons uh, for actually, or many uh, applications for going for an exaflop system, whether it be to do with climate change uh, and modeling modeling weather as well, but modern, modeling climate across the earth. Uh, there's many things around medical that they want to do it with, not only genomics. Um, so there, there are many use cases where they are looking forward to an exaflop system. This is what we need. And so the scientific world, I think, are all looking forward to when can we get that exaflop system. Well, you've already seen when we can get it because we've got a graph. And that graph is obviously true. Then, so if you take, extrapolate up, around about, let's call it the 2020 time frame, we will have an exaflop system for you. Great. I look forward to it. The, the Titan system, I haven't shown the current one, but I'll show you on the next slide. Titan was 8.2 megawatts which is quite a lot of power, to be perfectly honest. So this is the system in Oak, Roy Oak Ridge. But I don't, we can cope with that. Um, it's it's not, quite, not quite near a uh, power generating dam, but it's, it's all right. We can do it, do it OK. But to get to that exaflop, to have an exaflop's worth of power, if you did it with a CPU, so it's CPU only, so we don't go down the accelerator route, the amount of power you would need, electrical power, is the same amount of power as the whole of the Bay Area in San Francisco. I should have changed this to have London and, and, and the counties, I guess, this is a, obviously an American slide. Um, but it's a huge amount of power that you need. And there's a number of power stations that are used for actually uh, providing the power for the Bay Area at the moment. So that would be for just one system, if we only go for, for, G, uh, for a CPU system for exascale. So basically, the only way we're going to get there is some form of accelerator. And hopefully, I've showed you already that um, maybe GPUs might be the answer to that question. But only partially, as I still don't think we have the correct answer. Um, so for the systems that we had at the top of the top 500, I'm not sure where this graphic works or not. I, I did it uh, over the weekend, and now I'm not sure about those um, splashy egg things up at the top. But there. So. Um, what's that showing is each one of those um, yellowy and red things is a petaflop or a, or a graphic showing a petaflop, one of those. Uh, and down the bottom, the green little star is how much power. So for the first one, IBM Roadrunner in 2008, which was the first petaflop system, that 
was obviously one petaflop, and it took 2.3, just over 2 megawatts of power to run that. Another big system uh, was Fujitsu's K computer in Japan. Uh, it's another quite a big step forward. That one was 10 petaflops. That was 12.6 megawatts. The system after Titan, which we've spoken about, this is the Oak Ridge system, up to 17, near enough 18 petaflops. But luckily it came down a bit. I told you it's using GPUs, so we're expecting that to happen. GPUs are going to bring that power down performance. In 2013, um, not quite so good, but still not so bad with the uh, Intel 5s. Um, so again, Accelerator Technology has managed to, to get it to, to, uh, uh, to 17, 18 megawatts, but that is big for 34 petaflops of power, and that's where we are today. So that's the, the fastest supercomputer what the challenge has been for Exascale, and it has been for probably for three years, is the Exascale challenge was always, can you fit it into 20 megawatts? It's saying that that is the maximum you could expect for a computer center. And that's pretty big, to be honest. So that we don't have to have a nuclear power station next to every computer center. And so that's the target. But we're a long way from hitting it. So if we said that graphic there is 20 megawatts now, it's not a straight ratio that you can actually understand. How are we going to hit that if we actually scale up that way and scale up that way? There's such a disconnect in what we can actually do. GPU is going to help. Definitely will help. They're not going to help that much. So I think the biggest challenge we have to get to exascale is, is electrical power. It may well be that, I mean, at the moment, from everything I've seen, that by 20, probably 2022, we could have an exascale system that would be running at about 200 megawatts, 10x out. So the answers are not there by, by a long way. This is our big challenge, the big challenge. You've seen the lines, though. I mean, who can, who can argue with statistics? I mean, that line is going to get there. We're going to get to exascale, I'm sure, by whenever. Um, but are we going to have to have a you know, massive power station to do it? I don't know. But that is going to be the big challenge. Now, personally, I think that the answer may lie in some of the low power chips, things that are in your phone in your pocket, the ARM technologies or similar technologies where we've been looking at reducing the energy required per flop all the way along just because your battery life of your phone has been so important to everybody. So there's been a big driver there. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done because those processors are not going to be able to process the amount of compute power, today they, they're not, that's required by high performance computing. But I still think that that's really where we're probably going to go over the next six years up to 2020. We're going to see more of those low-powered chips coming in and sort of large matrices, large servers with many, many low-powered chips uh, to actually do that. Luckily, NVIDIA are in that space already, as you saw with Tegra that I mentioned right at the front. Um, and that a, an ARM with a GPU is a low power solution, but also gives you um, a high power solution. So the ARM, um, ARM servers that you can buy today, and there are not many, to be perfectly honest, of standard servers, there are certainly three that I'm aware of, they rely on the GPU to do all of the processing. Um, so if you compared it to a Intel processor, if you compared a program that did mostly parallel programming, they look pretty good both together because the arm is really just saying off you go GPU. If you looked at something that was much more balanced between CPU and GPU, the arm is miles away at the moment. So there's a long way to go. I feel that that's where that solution is going to come from, but um, it's almost my guess is as good as yours. I don't see where, where that disconnect, where we're going to fit that gap, where we're going to close that gap right now. GPUs are definitely the answer. Accelerators are definitely the answer to get us close, but can we get close enough to actually uh, make it? 
and get that exaflop in, uh, in 2020, 2022. And that was all I was going to say. Well, I think we should thank Jeremy very much indeed for the presentation. Thank you.